Hey guys, thank you for attending uh, the JL Communications Coffee and Conversation Series. Um, for your time, we will be sending out a $10 coffee card. Um, so look forward to that. That should arrive in an email. Um, we'll be having these type of um, conversations every Friday in the month of October um, for a half hour. It's a quick educational, you know, kind of what's going on in the industry. And um, so um, for those who, who know JIL, um, we appreciate your attendance. For those who don't know, uh, I'm just going to do a quick kind of overview of uh, what we, what we, where we came from and, and where we're going. Um, you know, we are a white glove technology solutions company that provides guidance and support to make sure businesses receive the best solutions for uh, the company. I don't know if you've met all of the uh, people with JL, but on your slide, you should see, you know, Charlie Booth, our president who founded it back in 96 as a traditional telecom agency, um, servicing and supporting um, customers in that telecom space. Um, we've got Brenda Young, who has been at uh, his side for uh, 20 plus years as our project manager. Um, myself as a solutions engineer that, that helps define kind of the scopes of the projects and, and kind of gets in the weeds with the technology. And then we have our, our sales team, um, Wes Orr, Cameron Sherlock, and Kyle Schneider, who all uh, have years of experience from different disciplines. But um, the one thing they have in common is they care about the customer. Um, you know, we started as a traditional telecom agency. And I want to say in the past five years, we've kind of pivoted towards more of a solutions approach that includes cybersecurity. Um, hosted phone systems, UCAS, uh, um, technologies like um, cloud, uh, data center, and things of that need, things that are typically as a service, okay? And we'll be discussing those over the next four weeks. On the uh, web here, we have uh, Miles Frenberg, who is part of Synoptech. Um, Miles, he's been with Synoptech for several several years they actually acquired his company um and his kind of claim to fame i don't want to say claim to fame but he likes to help solve business problems in a very unique way he's a very polished uh professional um we love him as far as the solutions he brings with synoptech and um you know today it, we're going to talk about cybersecurity, and it happens to be Cybersecurity awareness month so it's a great topic to kick this off. Uh, Miles, I'm going to hand it over to you. All right. Thanks, Sean. I hope I lived up to at least uh, something that you said. <laughs> I appreciate the partnership from JL. Uh, again, let's see. First of all, let's get my screen going here. How's that look? Did it do it or did it not? Yep. Oh, it did? Okay, good. Looks good. Beautiful. Let me get rid of this part here off of my screen. All right, so again, I'm Miles Feinberg. I manage our Southeast region for Synoptic. I'm a security evangelist. If you Google my name uh, out there on the interwebs, you'll actually probably come up with some YouTube videos of me doing security sessions. Normally they're about an hour. So we'll have like about 25 minutes or so. So we'll, uh, we will make it uh, work. And the parts I'll cut out are probably the bits that you don't want. So we're going to talk about uh, cybersecurity. I'm going to focus more on what Synoptic has seen. I'm going to make this less commercial. Of course, there will be some commercial stuff in here, but you know, we'll kind of keep it real. Let me see if I can get rid of this little toolbar right there. Okay. So just at a top level, I think you guys all know this. There used to be a thinking that basic security measures are sufficient, right? If you had um, there's a little click thing here. There we go. You know, if you had a firewall and antivirus, you were set, but obviously in a different different era. And there's so many more threat vectors to think about. You know, so many, you know, people are much more mobile. Well, today working from home, which is a you know tremendous vector. Drive by downloads just by visiting a website. Um, you know, I did a, an interesting case visit on a defense contractor and uh, and the Chinese 
uh, actors knew they ordered from a Chinese takeout and they infected the takeout menu that was online to deliver a payload because they knew they got lunch from there. So there's, you know, today there are just so many ways, you know, we hear about social engineering and, and that's why the concept of defense in depth is so important. It is, you know, there's not a single solution. And if you hear someone say there's a single solution, you know, they're wrong. But beyond tools, there's sometimes a focus on shiny tools and technology. But like, and you consider the case of Target, right? They had this high profile breach. They were heavily armed. They really had a tremendous budget, but they lacked one major ingredient. And that was, that was process. So if you think about uh, you know, solving for the bigger problem where the, the technology covers uh, was the issue, didn't have the right technology in 50 major breaches, but people process failures. You know, we learn about training people to be defended against social engineering. Time and time again, uh, I've been called after a company wired money. You know, there was a request when you train people with processes, we always call and verify wire instructions, always, right? Rather than just send, even it looks like it came from a credible authority, from the CFO to the, you know, the payables people. So, so I, the, the caution and the lesson is this, is you know, from Target to, to everyone, buying or subscribing uh, to a, a shiny tool, you know, that's the 28%. Would you rather solve for the 28 or the 72? It's obvious. You know, and the most common people in process failures, you, you know, if all else fails, you have to make sure you have reliable backups. Backups are the unsung hero, right? But if you have ransomware or some other thing, you know, do you have them? Do you test them? You, you know, it, it's, it's not sexy, but it, it's just as critical as ever. You know, companies are, you know, failure to routinely patch is an issue. That's how essentially Equifax was breached. Failure to enable logging, which makes it impossible to know what's happened or happening. You know, misconfigured systems that leave things wide open inside and out. And these are kind of just broad based people and process failures. So even if you have a tool, you're really kind of leaving yourself open unless you kind of have a comprehensive, mature approach to IT management. Um, one big reason for the increase uh, of, of breaches just in general is this concept of the attack surface. It keeps growing. The attack surface is the collection of all of those things that you have to protect and to monitor the threat vectors that, you know, the USB, no one really uses that, that, that much anymore, but it can auto deploy malware. All those applications that you run that that increase in size by tens of thousands of lines of code. All of those lines of code, in, you know, in, in every few thousand lines of code, there's X number of security holes, you know, that so those things are part of your attack surface. What you spin up virtual machines, hypervisors, you know, that's great. Uh, whether it's in the cloud or in your, your, own, your own data center, that's more attack surface, so easy to spin them up. Bring your own device, of course, now that everyone well, not everyone, but many companies are doing that to allow work from home. But you know, what are the policies that you have? But that's part of your, your attack surface. Attachments, links, you guys know all that. The ecosystem of vendors and partners that you trust and, and, and you know, interchange those things. So these are all just part of, that is why this growing attack surface really um, has made it so easy. I only have to find the weakest link in the chain to get into an organization. And that makes it even more important why defense in depth, the layered approach that is broad based, you know, not reliant on a, on a single tool or process here. Hey, Moff. Yes. Hey, Moff. We're going to, uh, we're going to stop and, and do a poll real quick. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Do I need All right. to do it? Okay. Um, if we can, yeah, put up that poll about how confident do you feel about your cybersecurity strategy? Yeah, we know it's important, but we don't have one. I've got it. I'm an expert and please help. So <laughs> if anybody's an expert, I would like to talk to them. <laughs> and, uh, give it another few seconds.
Okay. We appreciate that. Miles, go ahead. All right. Is it still showing my screen? Yes. Perfect. Okay. So this is an interesting just view of the thing. It's uh, the average organization, I should characterize, let's call it, a, let's leave it at mid-sized uh, enterprise business. They generate 2.7 billion unique transactions uh, in events. These are things like a user login, file upload, document edit, uh, attempt to log in, you know, all these different little events. And this volume of data obviously be impossible to manually search through an audit trail of activity identify potential threats. So organizations are investing in today in tools, which obviously use machine learning to cull through and identify anomalous events against all this background of noise every day. But even through those tools to cull through the events, it, it, it cuts it down to, um 2500 anomalous events uh so like when a user logs in from two locations uh from virginia and then the philippines in a short period of time right um that that seems highly unlikely and those things have to be investigated it could have been uh it could have been a genuine activity. You know, if, if somebody if somebody just logs in, doesn't usually log in from outside of the country, maybe they're traveling. That's anomalous. Uh, but maybe it, it is something, you know, so some of those events and less than 1% of those 2,500 in turn uh, are actual incidents to take action on. And even if you're lucky enough to have security professionals and staff, you know, in most organizations, they're suffering from alert fatigue, especially if you don't have a dedicated security department. They are doing lots of other jobs. Uh, so half or more enterprises have like six or more tools that generate an abundance of alerts and, uh, and about a third of the professionals basically ignore them. That's the target situation I mentioned before. A lot of just false positive and they're overwhelmed. So you really need kind of a dedicated team and the right tools that can really cull this down because it is it is a problem to be able to to see it, and in a timely a timely basis. Um, uh, I like this chart. This is just really quickly. Uh, this is there's a a parallel uh, here. This is this is really interesting to me. The de defensive posture of medieval castles to de cyber defense. There's lots of way to get to the center where the people have. The people are that you want to protect and the gold, you know, those are your systems and your data. It's fortified from all sides. So assuming the front gate would be breached, there's this murder hole. I didn't name it, right? But that's where you pour boiling water. And assuming they got past that, the vent entrance slowed them down, allowing the Bozeman at the top to get their shots in. And, and then inside the stairway was counterclockwise. I don't know if any of you understand the reason why they intentionally did that, because you normally grab onto the handrail but they made it counterclockwise so it would be their sword hand right so so this is a kind of you know defense in depth protect your data and systems as if it were gold and people's lives dependent on it and i i happen to personally like this this slide so that's why i show it so this is synoptics parallel to the defensive posture of medieval castles uh, there are a lot of ways to get to the center where the people and the gold are fortified from all sides. But, as, you know, um, we have detection and threats uh, um, for vulnerabilities. You know, again, we're talking about patching the systems, managing just because you have even a modern firewall. Is it misconfigured? Right. Are you reviewing the configuration? What are you allowing through or not? You know, do you have are you doing? pen test um do you have two-factor authentication if you don't like that is low hanging high you know fruit uh high value um are you doing are you preparing your employees for the social engineering threats that are the easiest way to break into an organization by doing user training and testing why break through the firewall when you can get through Nancy in HR or Bob in marketing, because Bob, of course, clicks on everything. Um, there is evasive malware. So there's anti-evasion uh, uh, solutions for your endpoints. And I could go around all these things. Now. Hey, hey Miles, what, yes. what's, that, what's that VCSO up there? I mean, that, 
that uh-huh. kind of okay. starts the charge, doesn't it? Right. Governing all of this, you know, many organizations have a chief information security officer and uh, a lot of, of uh, cyber ins- liability insurance policies or governances um, in some states, you know, if you do certain business in certain industries, you have to anoint someone to wear that hat. And they have a lot of responsibility and accountability. Some organizations don't have someone focused in that role. And so as part of the solution set that Synoptic provides, when we provide security services, we also couple that with a virtual, like a, a time, you know, a security professional who wears that hat. Now that service can be available separately, but you know, someone is looking and saying, look, pragmatically, we can't do everything. What are, what are our biggest risks? And they're different for every organization. So there's a lot of interview and discussion and let's build a plan to take, you know, we're going to have some, some risks. Let's minimize them with a rationale. Like what would happen if, how would we recover if, what would it cost to make us better prepared, you know, and is it worth it considering the risk? So that's that, that's what that CISO does. A lot of really smart guidance from years of experience and accreditation in, in that area. Did I answer that? Perfect. No, that's, that's awesome. Yeah. Uh, let me give I, the results. Let me give the results of that, the poll we put up there. Oh yeah, please. Yeah. If you don't mind. So, um, 43% know cybersecurity is important. 29% need some help and 29% are an expert. So interesting, interesting. How many were experts? 29%. Okay. A third I love almost. it. Yeah. I love it. Whether you are or not, uh, you know, certainly you appreciate them? the confidence. Hey, Mom, you want to hire them? <laughs> you want to hire them? Yeah. <laughs> we, well, it, the, the truth be told, you know, across uh, many of our areas, in, including uh, cyber defense, we are hiring. And uh, uh, <laughs> we were worried going into this pandemic. I know we're on a tangent here, but uh, we did not let anyone go. And in fact, we are hiring. So uh, it's a good, good space yeah. to be in. <laughs> yeah, right. All right. Uh, this is the overview. And like I said, I'm not going to go, I, and we don't have time. And quite frankly, you don't want, uh, you've probably seen lots of product demos. I'm going to be really focused on one and I'll tell you why. Um, and that is the one that it's, uh, it's in, if you can see my mouse, I don't know, uh, let's see, for whatever reason. Oh, there we go. Um, around zero day advanced network compromise. Um, and I, and I'll, and I'll, you'll see why as it unfolds here. And it, and I'll, one of the reasons is we just don't have enough time. So, uh, and I'm going to just skip through the, you know, again, we hammered the concept of defense in depth, right? Wrapping all of your, your gold in these layers with, you know, people process, um, and all the protections at, at different layers of, of your systems. Um, so the, when, a, when a breach occurs in your organization, most of the time there's no alarms to go off. You know, the perpetrators have some initial foothold, they have limited access to one system. They don't have network diagrams, right? They uh, that they know they have to remain under the radar while they look around. Um, the process of escalating their access and looking for what's valuable takes time. And they're operating in a really stealthy fashion. Most firms only learn about the breach when they're notified by outside parties like vendors, uh, you know, customers, the FBI. However, for firms that are notified externally, it's an average of 320 days um, from compromise to discovery uh, that, you know, 320 days of of the compromise. However, for firms that self-discover, learn about the breach, an average of 56 days of the compromise. And that, and by, by having that advantage of time, you're not only surprising your adversary before they can do what they do, you know, to down to 56 days, um, getting, you know, there before data is exfiltrated, you're controlling uh, PR, 
right? Rather than it's already out there and now I'm completely reactive. Um, you can safeguard PII, PHI, customer contracts, you know, and if you also think about it, uh, if you give people ample time, depending on what your systems are, data can be altered. Forget about exfiltrated. Can you imagine what can harm if you are, uh, if you have contracts, payment information, uh, medical data, prescriptions, things like that. I just want an extra zero on my paycheck. Well, yeah, and, and those <laughs> things those things have been done. So what if that's their intent rather than, you know, you hear about ransomware and, and things like that. So the importance of investing in strong process scanning, you know, you want to be on the right hand side of that internal discovery. So um, I'm going to get into something here, first of all, about our approach, right? We recognize there's not any way to guarantee systems won't be breached. Anyone that says they guarantee it, you know, probably should be highly skeptical. And for every lock you put on, someone's going to find a way to pick it. If you build a 10-foot fence, someone's going to build an 11-foot ladder. So the synoptic value position is proposition is to minimize our, our customer's risk. Be vigilant and on guard for those in the inevitable security incidents. Drive it down to that earliest discovery because of that advantage that it gives you and be poised to remediate. Now, those are easy, flowery, great, great visions here. Um, again, a 24 by seven service People that are focused just on security, you know, they, that have training in all the tools in policy management, defense in depth, the process components that we that I talked about, uh, you know, as, and as a service, it's not necessarily selling you specific tools that you have to kind of self-manage and invest and tune. Uh, I think we already did this one. So, so I want to focus on. Uh, one solution here that really drives towards that earliest discovery and is the most comprehension. And we have this a managed network anomaly detection solution based entirely on machine learning from Darktrace. That means it and, it, and it doesn't require, by the way, any agents. It doesn't run based on any rules. That means that zero day exploits, you know, the zero day is something that there is no patch for it. The software has an issue. Uh, maybe it's known and out there, maybe it's not known, um, and if people sell zero day exploits, but it can it doesn't care like anything anomalous that happens in your environment is detected. This is the the UI that I would love to have gone through here. But just and I have been through, I've been working with Darktrace, and we've been a premier partner of theirs for years. I've been personally involved in so many organizations. Um, uh, in a, uh, we'll talk about a 30 day proof of value, which is no strings. You know, we, if we prove value, great, then we can talk about it. Uh, if not, we pack up and go home, we invest in it. But in those 30 days alone, we had a electric car company, not Tesla, uh, but I can't say who, uh, that we found there were people that were crypto mining using their neighbor's workstation. They were using Tor, which is basically a traff, uh, hiding and encrypting their traffic, presumably to share, you know, intellectual property out there. We had a county sheriff's office where uh, the, the people in charge turned off rules in the firewall so they could stream games, online games, into the, 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 into the jail area and porn. Uh, we had a phone system itself that was compromised. We actually detected when one of our customers hired a third party to do a pen test and, in, and that third party inadvertently infected them during the day. Uh, so it's not just malware, but uh, employees. We, we've detected all of a sudden an employee packaged up and, and sent to um, Dropbox, uh, tons of, of uh, contract files. So anything that is anomalous in your organization, there's no rules. It's just what's unusual for you. Someone like I gave you, example, logs in remotely. Hey, um, hey Miles, Miles, let me grab you real quick. I jumped in here. So I'm here in Louisville, Kentucky. If I made lamps for a living, who's breaking in my company? I mean, my point is if I'm, if I'm a manufacturing company in, in Louisville 
why why is someone coming in to me well everyone's a target because it's a it's a first of all it's you're not always being targeted specifically because you're a lamp company it's a great question uh uh, every firm can be monetized, especially manufacturers where how many, you know, how much does it cost per hour of downtime? Knowing that, that leverage, you can extract a ransom. Okay. And I heard, I heard the first half of 2020, uh, ransomwares, it, there was more ransomware in the first half of 2020 than any year previously, period. Right. That Now, uh, there is a, a, an accompanying uh, component to this uh, to this system here that actually acts autonomously. So uh, if there is a fast moving threat at the, and the likelihood and the implications of that threat uh, through the AR detected to be you know severe and high likely, it throttles it and, and, rent, and, and notifies. It can also be set to not be autonomous, but just to notify, including on a, on a mobile app. So in addition to our systems, it's, it's what has been done with AI is simply incredible. Like you don't want, I've been to so many companies that said, look, we're not a threat, like you said. And then uh, there was a, I know we're going over time, but since you asked, we had a company, huge bus company, bus meaning they, they, they students, and they have a mobile app. Like the parents can see when, when kids get on the bus, get off the bus, stuff like that. They broke in, they started sending messages to parents' devices that were inappropriate uh, and, and scary. You know, when you're dealing with people's kids, it lost a lot of trust. And they were like, after that, they, after that discussion once back where they said, we're not a target, they're like, we need to do everything. We got it, this can never happen again. All right. So again, I've seen a lot, I've seen a lot. This is, the, this is my final thing. Uh, and we do this as a, a 30 day, proof of value. We actually bring in, implement the tools, meet with your teams weekly, shine a light onto everything. And in that period of time, remember I gave you the jail, the sheriff's office, the electric car company. I can give you lots of stuff that happened in those PVs. I can't guarantee something interesting. We always find stuff, misconfigurations. Your, your visitor network is accidentally commingled with your, your guest net Wi-Fi with your, your production, something. We always find things. Um, so that might be a call to action. Uh, with our partnership with JL, we've facilitated that. I know that we're out of time, so uh, I'm not going to cover any of these others. You know, we have uh, we've been doing this for a long time. You probably tell I've been doing this for a long time. We are a global operation. These are our offices uh, around the world. Of course, we're U.S. based, and uh, lots of great logos. And there's my ugly mug. I'm done. Boom. Uh, Sean, you're on mute. I appreciate that, Miles, and I appreciate everybody attending. Uh, do you have any final words, Wes? No, I just want to thank Miles. Uh, you can you can obviously tell he's passionate about what he does. Uh, we've found that very helpful with a couple of customers to have a guy like him uh, that, that is passionate about what he does. And really, we just want to say thank you for attending and, and hope you can make the next three weeks. We've got some, some good, interesting um, things for you the next three weeks. Yeah, the next topic actually is going to focus on customer experience and how the contact center uh, technology has changed to help with the end user or customer experience, which is uber important. Once you, once you get a customer, it's, it's imperative that we keep that customer, right? So uh, that, you know, raising the bar. Um, up for the customer experience is, is absolutely um, a differentiator uh, out there in the world. So um, without further ado, we appreciate you all uh, attending. Thank you. Um, thank you, Miles. Thank you, all the uh, participants. Look for your $10 uh, coffee card in your email, and we look forward to seeing uh, you next week. Same time, same place. Thank you all. Thank you.